Uh, as Malcolm said, I have uh, decided to step down from my post at the university and start preaching uh, with all of my energy, um, which you know should be a good thing, uh, I hope, and hopefully will help you all too. I want to see the church grow in faith and also in number, but um, I think the truth is probably at the basis or at the base of all of these things. We love the truth. We want the truth. We want to find other people who also love the truth and want the truth and to join hands together in the service of God in this regard. So it occurred to me that this would be the right place to start with a series of lessons about truth. And I think that the theme has to be in Proverbs 23. I don't know another way to do this. <clears throat> but yeah, this uh, series is Buy Truth and Do Not Sell It. Uh, this is supposed to work. Give me a second. There we go. <laughs> uh, right. We have to rely on Proverbs 23, and I think this is going to be the case. I can't think of another thing in Scripture that uh, captures well what we're trying to do. <clears throat> captures so well what we're trying to do. It's uh, Proverbs 23, and at verse 15 you notice, My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. And this is the correct, I guess, the proper scope of a parent's concern for their children. What we want for our children is for them to be wise. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. What they need is the Word of God. And the advice that he has here, among other things, there's a lot of parental advice in this chapter, but the one that we want, of course, is verse 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, understanding. The significance of that, of course, is that, you know, when you say buy and do not sell, it's not an investment. We're not making money on it. The idea is not that it will ever be used for gain uh, in a mon any monetary sense. But that it's worth buying it, acquiring it. This is not a, a lease. It's not an investment. It's not a rental. It's, you know, it's not even a contribution. It's ownership. You will acquire this thing, you will own this thing. It is the truth. And it is not for sale. Get that and don't take any price to give it away either. But it's both positive and negative, and the same is true for wisdom, instruction, understanding. But, you know, it's not much of a spoiler alert to tell you that, well, you know where those things come from, don't you? It's the word. Sometimes people talk about buy and hold. But even then, that's an investment. That's you buying with a 30-year horizon in mind when you're thinking perhaps, so oh, I should put my, uh, you know, I should get a mutual fund to diversify to uh, make sure that the, um, you know, make sure that I'm hiring somebody smarter than me to manage this money. And, you know, if I have 30 years, I'm going to put it in an international fund because a 30-year average on those is much higher than, say, bonds. Um, yeah, fine. That would be buy and hold, right? But this is not saying buy and hold. This is saying buy and it's not for sale. It's yours. In Matthew 13, I think that this really is the thing that corresponds to the proverb that we just read. It's Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46, where Jesus teaches about the kingdom of heaven, and says, It is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is very much, to my thinking, the way that the proverb is intended to be read. When somebody knows something, in this case the merchant, in search of fine pearls. This one knows pearls in some sense. This one is looking for fine pearls. 
They want to know. This is a person who loves truth. A person who knows what is true, what is not true, who is looking for honesty and integrity in people, um, is, you know, investigating the arguments that are proffered in support of various things in this world, political views or philosophies, whatever it might be. That is the merchant in search of fine pearls. But when that person comes upon the gospel of Jesus, it is the pearl of great value. There's nothing wiser. There's nothing greater. Well, this merchant, even, is willing to sell all that he has and buy it. Everything he has acquired thus far does not equal the value of the pearl that he has found. It is worth more than everything put together. So he went, having found this pearl, he left so that he could go sell everything in order to buy this one, because that's the one that's the most valuable one. That's what we mean by buy the truth and do not sell it. It's worth everything that he knew and everything that he thought was wise and good up until that point, and more. That's going to be how he moves forward. The kingdom of heaven is like that. If you are the kind of person who's looking for the truth, um, and you come, up, you come upon the words of the Lord, you read the gospel, say, for the first time for yourself, and you listen to what it's saying, realize that this is the teacher come from God and that there is nothing like this. You will realize that is the pearl of great, of great value. That is worth everything. And it's got to be, you know, I don't know how to describe this, but when you are not... Um, it's especially clear, I should say, when you have not been brought forth by Christians. Uh, you know, my mother and father were not Christians, and the gospel was so different from what I had ever been taught and learned that there's this really stark contrast. But I know, too, that there can be still a stark contrast between what our families do and what God says, even when our families are Christians. But still, I think either way, the comparison holds up. That what God has is better, and what the Word contains is better than anything we have known to this point, and should be taken over and above everything. So that's the kind of the opening thought, the controlling philosophy behind these lessons is there's nothing like truth and nothing takes the place of truth and nothing is as valuable as truth is, whatever it is, if it's money, if it's family, uh, whatever. If it's knowledge, wisdom, philosophy, understanding, none of them are better than God's word. It's more important than everything. So if we go to the next question, which is, what is truth? And that starts in John 16, for example. What is the truth anyway? I wanted to look at these passages of John. We're starting with what he says to his disciples. We'll move to what he prays God, and what he asks God in prayer. And then we will go to his discussion with Pilate. And all of these are looking at what is truth anyway. John 16, verses 12 to 13, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak and declare to you things that are to come. So first of all, the Lord himself knew that there was more than they could handle at the time while he still walked the earth and that more would have to come after his resurrection. That's the spirit of truth. And that spirit of truth on coming guides the apostles into all the truth. Not speaking his own things, but the things of God. So what is the truth? Well, one of the ways of knowing the truth is it's what the apostles said, because the apostles are guided by the spirit of God. 17th chapter is where Jesus 
having spoken these words in verse 1, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you as well. That's John 17, 1. And we skip down to 6 through 9. Here's what he asks of God. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. That's his disciples. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. Now they know that everything you've given me is from you. For I've given them the words you gave me, and they've received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. So our Lord prays for these disciples who have come to know that Jesus is from the Father and that the truth um, is where he comes from. The Lord prays for them and he says, not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. They are yours. That doesn't mean he doesn't care about the world. We're just not talking about them yet. We're starting with the apostles. What he says there in 15 To 17 is, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Let me go back to 15 and 16 for a moment. He said, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but rather that you keep them from the evil one. We're not intended to leave the world, to hide from the world, we're supposed to be in it. But we do have a prayer from Jesus that we be kept from the evil one, and that we be not of the world, as he is not of the world. Sanctify means make holy in the 17th verse, and how are you made holy? Well, it's in the truth. And what is the truth? Your word is truth. It's God's word that makes us holy. It's God's word that sets us apart from the world around us. And it's God's word that is truth. Then he prays for the rest, 20 to 21. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It all comes back to God has sent his son. And the world is to believe in God, or to trust God, that he has made the necessary sacrifice, that he has taken the necessary lengths to deliver us, to give us the truth that will save, the truth that will sanctify, verse 17. Not just for these, but the, those who will believe in me through their word. The mechanism that the Lord intended is rather clear. God sends the Lord. The Lord picks the apostles and sends them. But also, when he leaves, he sends the Spirit, and the Spirit guides them into all the truth. And we are sanctified in the truth. And we, ourselves, have come to believe in Jesus through the word of the apostles. Because that's what the the book the Bible is. It's the words of those whom God chose as his messengers. We're the ones who believe in Jesus through the words of the apostles. And this is how you attain unity. The world can believe that the Father has sent him. That's the point. The authority is the Father. Then in John 18, we'll look at Pilate. We should characterize Pilate accurately because this is where the rub is. So far, we have been talking about mother and apple pie, right? (laughs) Who is against mother and apple pie? That's what that means. I'm for mother and apple pie. Oh, yeah, so am I. Yes, now you're ready to run for office. John 18, 29, beginning, Pilate went outside to the Jews and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They said, if he were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. 
That is not an answer. <laughs> and Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. You can hear he's annoyed by these people. <laughs> that is annoying. You bring him here and want me to kill him? You're not even going to tell me what he's done wrong? Well, you know, if it, if it hadn't been e evil, he wouldn't be in this situation. And that's the way that people are. They think, well, that can't be the truth because they're suffering. You know, look at their situation. It's just like the woman at the well. Who's going to listen to her? And yet she had the truth. Pilate said, take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. You know, I, I don't want to be bothered by this. <laughs> and the Jews said, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So they're saying, we're appealing to you because you have authority to put to death in this region. We don't. Which is also so as to fulfill the word Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. Which is to say, an eye if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all people to me. Be lifted up is a euphemism for crucifixion. Crucifixion was the power of the Roman state. So Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said, Are you the king of the Jews? Why is he asking this? Because insurrection is the right charge if you're trying to crucify somebody. That's why. Are you claiming to be a king? Because if you are, then I can crucify you. Easy. Jesus answered, Are you asking this of your own accord? Or did others tell you this about me? As in, Pilate has a chance to care about the truth. That's what that means. Are you asking an honest question? Or are you just trying to find an accusation? That's what that means. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? That means, no, I do not care about spiritual things. That's what that means. No. I'm not asking you about your spiritual teachings. I couldn't care less about such matters. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? That's interesting, because he asked them what he has done, and they said, uh, you know, he wouldn't be here if he weren't a troublemaker. So now he asked Jesus, what have you done? You were delivered over by the leaders of your nation. Why did they do that? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would have been fighting so that I would not be delivered over to the Jews who handed me over to you. But as it is, my kingdom is not from this world. And Pilate said to him, so you are a king. <laughs> He's trying to get it. Jesus said, you said it. I'm a king. For this reason I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What that means is the extent of his kingdom is the people who listen to his voice, the people who are of truth. Yes, I am a king. I am the king of those who are of the truth, those who listen to my voice. My kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom is of the truth. So he set the scope there, which in Pilate's ear is, okay, that's a special. You know, this is some kind of a spiritual metaphor for king. You're not actually trying to lead an insurrection against Roman authority in Judea. That's all he was trying to figure out. And said to him, what is truth? This is like what he said to them. You take him and judge him. I, you know, what do I want with this? And Jesus said, my scope, my kingdom is truth. And he said, ah, what is truth? Just another one of these religious Jewish people. You know, one of these religious Jewish teachers here. He doesn't care, you see. It's utter contempt. Yeah. 
After which, he went back outside to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. So we have no, we have nothing to bring a charge against him that warrants crucifixion. This is not going to pass the audit in Rome. We're not going to do this. That's what he was saying at the time. Of course, he was persuaded otherwise. But this is to say, what is truth? Well, Pilate asked what is truth in order to dismiss it as though, well, that doesn't exist. That can't be known. It's not certain. But I don't find any guilt in him either. Now, we know that Pilate, as a Roman in authority, was, um, as we say, dismissive. Not concerned about this. Really just wanted to see whether this man posed some kind of civil unrest problem. Because many people did. Typically, in that day and age, when somebody rose up and said he was the Christ or the anointed of the Lord... He thought that he was going to be the king of Israel who would lead the rebellion and free them from Roman rule and make them their own independent nation again. And that happened many times, and many persons were crucified for that crime in the first century. Which is how they cataloged Jesus. I mean, when they came to him and said, you know, he's trying to make himself the king, you're no friend of Caesar's, you know, these are the charges against the other insurrectionists who were real. So he's been put to death as if he were one of them, but that's obviously not what he was about at all. Anyway, Pilate's perspective on it is just that. Uh, it's just another one of these guys. This is an argument about teaching that is so important to them, and I couldn't care less. I'm just here for civil authority. That's his way of looking at it. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is how much it parallels the way that uh, people read the Bible. On the one hand, they think it cannot be understood. They think we have no way of knowing, um, no way of understanding what God actually wants us to do. On the other hand, I find no guilt in him. You know, I'm happy to hear your reading, to hear your opinion about this. Just don't bind it. That's what they want. The only thing that is bound is that you do not bind. We must agree to disagree. That's what people think. And that's a good thing to do when it comes to politics and uh, economics and business and things that are controversial or controvertible, rather, among men. But that is a very poor thing to do with the truth that comes from God. He is not a man. And he's not subject to human frailties. Let's go back a little bit here. Think about it this way, if you will. Truth calls us to something. Truth means something. The existence of a truth that is knowable, that is understandable, necessarily means that there is accountability. If you can know the truth, then why don't you? If you can understand the truth, then why aren't you doing it? That's what happens, and that's what people don't want. That's what people are afraid of. Because as soon as you start to do the truth, well, there's a cost to that. So I'm pulling from Psalm 119, which is, you know, the acrostic. But there's a couple of letters here that, that I think are particularly useful with regard to buy the truth and don't sell it. We're now talking, we've identified what truth is, we are now talking about do not sell it. Psalm 119, verses 65 to 67, we have you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. That's 
verse 60, uh, 67 of Psalm 119. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. 69 says, The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. 71 to 72, It's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. That's what it means, don't sell it. Are you afflicted? Are you being smeared with lies by the insolent? The proud, that is. The psalm says, it's good for me. That's good for you. I learned God's statutes that way. Remember what he said at first, uh, I'm sorry, at, at 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Doesn't James say the same thing, brethren? Count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. The law of your mouth is better than thousands of gold and silver pieces. There is not something that is worth more than this law. There's not something that's worth more than the truth of God. He's willing to suffer because of it. He's willing to hold on to it even to his own hurt. That's the truth. That is do not sell it. And then we move to a different letter, Resh. Uh, 153 is the verse. Psalm 119, verse number 153 is where Resh begins. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I don't forget your law. I plead my cause, redeem me, give me life according to your promise. Down to 156. Great is your mercy, Lord, give me life according to your rules. And 57. My, many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I don't swerve from your testimonies. 59 to 60. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous rules endures forever. This one also is suffering, isn't it? Look on my affliction. I don't forget your law. Give life according to your promise, he says in 50, 154. Give life according to your rules. And then in the end, of, at 160, every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The sum of your word is truth. We talked earlier how God's word is truth and it sanctifies. And here the sum of the word is truth. And so again, is it worth suffering? Affliction, a need for deliverance, a cause that must be uh, pled on your behalf, a redemption, a buyback. Many are my persecutors and adversaries, but I don't swerve from your testimonies. Is it worth that to you? Because that's what it means not to sell it. We know the truth, we love the truth, but you don't want to be that, you know, that seed in the parable of the sower, you're actually the ground. You don't want to be the rocky soil in the parable of, of, the, of the sower, where a plant springs up, but there's rocks under it, and when the sun comes out and the heat scorches the plant because there's no root. They obey the gospel, they say they're Christians, but there's a rock bottom here, this far and no further, God. I'm willing to give up some, but not all. That's what happens. The sum word is truth. All of his word. Is the dedication to it worth the suffering? Is there a cause for this? What else does truth call you to do? Well, Isaiah 45, I think very important. Buy the truth and don't sell it. Get wisdom, get understanding, get instruction. Listen to Isaiah 45. Again, what truth means is accountability. 
If God can speak a word that we can understand, and he can, what kind of God would he be if he couldn't? Well, then isn't it incumbent upon us to understand it? Do you love the truth or not? Do you believe in the power of God or not? Don't believe in the power of me. I don't have a lot of power. Believe in the power of God's word. Isaiah 45, 18 to 19, thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, he's God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. That's a very important thing. Why did he make this place anyway? Why do we exist? He didn't create it to be empty. He formed this to be inhabited. God didn't speak into the air, just giving the truth, giving his son so that, you know, there would be this great piece of literature to inform the Western uh, English language tradition. No, no, that's not why. The city of God, the church of Christ, is to be inhabited, not to be empty. I am the Lord, there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness, I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. He didn't say, seek me in vain. See, that is what happens if you think that we cannot understand God. If you think we cannot understand the Bible, then you think God told us, seek me in vain. Because that's what it is. If I can't understand what he said, then I seek him in vain. But that's not what he said. He said, I speak the truth. I declare what is right. And, as he said earlier, not in secret and not in the land of darkness. It's not hidden. This is out there in the open. Why does it exist not to be empty? It's for those who will believe the truth, who will come to listen to this. It's our role as the created beings in this creation to worship our creator, to serve him, to glorify him with our lives, even if it costs us something. I dare say especially when it costs us something because that's when it's most valuable to God and to him be the glory. Finally, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. As we talk about buy the truth and don't sell it. What is the church's role in this matter? Well, I think we have it fairly plain here. First of all, says Paul, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and a quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. The church is to make supplication, to make, to get, uh, to pray, uh, to intercede, and to give thanks for all people, our governing authorities, people of high position, whoever it may be. That is good, he says, and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that even possible? Can you be saved? Well, yes. Can you come to the knowledge of the truth? Yes, certainly you can. You must, if in order to be saved. And it's what God wants. And it's why the church prays for people. Ultimately, so they also can be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Does God get what he wants or not? It's up to you whether he gets what he wants in your life. You make him the king of your life by obeying him or not. For now. And there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. 
Yes, there is one person, one mediator, who was God and man. That's Christ Jesus. He mediates on our behalf. Yes, we pray for everybody, including intercessions on their behalf. But the, the mediator that effects or brings about our salvation is Jesus Christ, who is God and man, who was tempted in all points, like as we, yet without sinning. This is the one in whom there is salvation. This is the one in whom all things have been brought together. But again, notice how God desires that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Remember, he did not say, seek me in vain. He wants us to come to that knowledge. So will you come, is the real question. That's the end of our introductory lesson. So, the question for you is, will you obey the gospel of Jesus? Will you obey the gospel, putting him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, that your sins may be washed away, that you might be a new person in Jesus, a Christian, a child of God? We certainly hope that everybody will do that. It's the the best thing for everybody. It's the best thing for the world. And we'll help you to obey God in this way if that is your need today. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Well, let us help you with our prayers. Nobody here is above temptation. Nobody's got a lock on that sinless life. We're not saying that. But we are saying that you can obey God. You can do what is right. And we ought to expect that of one another so as to help one another on to heaven. If we can help you with our prayers, we'll pray with you for you. If we can help you to obey the gospel, we'll help you do that. Let your spiritual need be known uh, at this time while we sing the song that is selected. <laughs>